Our next speaker overwhelmed the What Design Can Do audience in 2012 with his inspiring talk on Architecture for Humanity. The organization he founded and run for two decades brought architectural solutions to humanitarian crises. After leaving Architecture for Humanity, Sinclair started the Department of Small Works, a social impact design collective that partners with social ventures, nonprofits, and foundations to implement building solutions for communities in need. Teams are currently working on projects in Afghanistan, Iceland, Italy, Jordan, Nepal, South Sudan, and the United States. The eternal optimist is back at what design can do to overwhelm us again. Please welcome Cameron Sinclair. You got a clicker? Okay, we're going to try something kind of unique, um, simply because the talk um, I'm going to give, one, I've never given it before, um, so I could really screw the pooch on it. But secondly, um, there's a project I'm going to show where we co-created a project in the refugee camps, and they wanted to see the talk, so I'm going to live stream it, um, and so... I have to figure this out. Okay, <laughs> whether they can see the screen or not. Okay, this. Maybe this will work. Okay, hopefully the. Okay, we got we got it. Okay, Jordan's on. Okay, so let me take the clicker. Hi guys. Um, so this is a really important phrase, because quite often we're told, well, what's th what's the criteria? What's the brief? And then we answer that. But we don't often say, what's the question? And why don't we question the question? And to create, we really have to first question everything. And I think this is a really important thing in our lives. So the question that I'm going to try and approach um, is very simple, which is, where is everybody? In the next 20 years, we're going to hit peak population. There's going to be about 8.7 billion people that live on the planet. And as designers, you're thinking, well, how do we deal with this urban development? How do we deal with density? How do we look at housing this last billion people? The question that we're not asking ourselves is, where are the last billion? Now, we've seen the megacities, these huge kind of informal settlements are growing up, whether it be in Sao Paulo or Lagos, um, the, the emerging uh, uh, countries that are, are burdened with this kind of informal uh, reality. You have shrinking cities. Most people don't realize that one in three cities in the West is shrinking. People are leaving their cities. And as a result, there's divestment from that community. And in turn, that means that social services are, are pulled from that, from that city. And you end up with places like Baltimore, where we have uh, a militarized police force that have to deal with a city that doesn't have the social services to deal with those most in need. And we end up with the situations that are happening across the, uh, the West. And then you have instant cities. Um, as, as, as there was a great question that was asked in the first sex session, which is how long does a refugee camp uh, last? And the, the, the average age is 17 years. But much, most of these agencies, like the UNHCR, have days to respond. I mean, you imagine that. You have days to respond to an issue, but you have to think about the kind of urban planning aspects for many years. It's almost impossible. So people call this a camp. Right? You know, well, let's think about this as a refugee camp. It's not a camp, it's a city. And so we need to think about those who are in this kind of flux, in this temporary situation, as living in a temporary city. 52 million people were displaced by level three emergencies. These are the kind of top level emergencies last year. And what we don't talk about are the hidden numbers, that there's 171 million people who were displaced through conflict. This is huge numbers of people. Now, let's think about the future. At the same time, we have a planet that's slowly sinking into the oceans. You know, we have islands like Tuvalu who have made agreements with New Zealand to move their entire population to another country. And that, that, that is a history, a culture, a community on mass moving, mass migration. We're talk I'm talking to a couple of islands who are talking about purchasing land in Australia and taking huge tracts of land. And this is the future shock that we're going to look at. And as we, we, we kind of 
respond to each disaster one after another, whether you're dealing with what's happening in Syria or Nepal or, you know, that there could be something that happens tomorrow, we still have to think about what's happening in 20, 30 years. Right now, 50% of the, of, of the global poor are living in conflict-affected uh, uh, or fragile states. But very rapidly, it's going to be 80% of the global poor. There's, as we're seeing kind of the gentrification of Western cities, what we're also seeing is the densification of poverty. About 300 million people are going to be displaced when we hit, hit peak population. This is going to be a mobile population. And this is a community that has not been addressed by the design community. Now, we talk about humanitarian response as an emotional attachment. Like there's a, you know, there's like an ad campaign with a pretty kid drinking water with, you know, and, and we're supposed to be emotionally connected to it. But we're talking about a multi-billion dollar business. And the problem with that is quite often you find these individual solutions and the instant reaction is let's make it bigger. Bigger is better. And that scale is impact. We need to impact as many people as possible to scale this idea as rapidly as possible. Well, here's the truth. This scale, scale, <laughs> scale is bullshit, right? Because what happens is you end up creating a kind of a dumbing down of a design solution in order to maximize the number of people you're, you're, you're helping. You know, when we were working in Haiti, we did an audit of all of the impact numbers of all of the NGOs in the country during the earthquake. And it turns out that we were, as the West, were helping about 50 million people. The only slight problem with that is there's only 9 million people in that country. What we were doing is we were saying, well, I fed this person, so that's one impact number. I gave them food, I gave them shelter, so that's one impact number. I gave them clothes, so that in one impact number. I built a well, well, I funded that well. So you end up like such a need to, to get impact numbers that you begin to forget the individual. And there's been a lot of talk right now about resilience. Like, well, if, if we could just design cities better, if communities can be much more prepared for, for future disasters, then we'll be fine. So let's figure out how to design up front. The problem with that, it's like, it's like vitamins. Like, you can, you can make as many vitamins as possible. You can do ad campaigns as possible, but some people are just not going to take them. And when you're more concerned with putting food in your kid's mouth, you're not going to be concerned about vitamins. So you're talking about sustainability um, at the level of survival. So we need to design sustainability for that. So over the last 20 years, I know you're looking at me and like, how could this guy have 20 years of experience? Um, <laughs> it's working out and, you know, not going in the sun. but. Um, <laughs> With 20 years uh, of experience, what I've begun to learn is we need to go beyond participatory design process. There's been a big push on that. We need to go beyond the idea of finding solutions, having kind of like a, a six-month window to figure out the design solution. We need to think about transient design. We have to think about ways where we can design for this mobile population that's going about, about to happen. And there's some really great things that have happened. When I was with Architecture for Humanity, we worked on some really kind of funky uh, designs using rapidly deployed bamboo housing, um, or where, whether it be kind of 3D printed, recycled wood homes. There's groups like EXO and Included that are looking at the idea, in the case of, of China, um, one in nine people um, who are working are migrant populations. So you imagine almost, you know, you know, almost, you know, 100 million people are moving and working at the same time, and therefore their living situation is that. So how do you create education systems that allow for the continuity? And so you have this high-tech solution, and quite often we in, in the developed world, or as my friends in Africa and Asia like to say, in the overdeveloped world, um, we think technology is solution. We can 3D print everything. We can, you know, injection mold everything. Like there's going to be a new solar panel that's going to mean everyone on the planet is going to be able to have electricity. That's great. But we also have to think about the low-tech solutions, the ones that are being done from communities who have lived there for generations, who understand the context, understand the materiality. Here's two examples. So uh, we had a grant for about $100,000 to build uh, some tent cities. And we got it from a private donor. And instead of building the tents, what we did is we worked with this amazing architect called Yasmin Lari to develop this 
um, bamboo frame um, single story home that could be replicated in a kind of build it forward model. So you build a home, um, it's about $800 a house, and, that, and part of the social contract is you will train the next family to build the next house. So from this $100,000 grant, which we got about 2008, 2009, I forgot about it. Right? We, built, we built the three villages, we went back to the donor, we had this very funny thing where we were like, hey, we forgot to build the tents, we built permanent houses, oops. Right? And they thought it was very funny, and, and, and that was great. Well, I called them back recently and said, well, we've, we're now on our 40,000th home. Right? So 40,000 homes have come from this. This is the mobile camel clinic. Um, it's very simple. Your doctors are in a village. They're treating uh, patients. They wrap up the clinic. They put it on the back of a camel. You whack the camel on the rear. It walks to the next village. And the solar system has generated enough power to run the clinic in the next village. So it's a camel power clinic. So in, and, and then you get to even more indigenous, the idea of design without designers, where people in such desperation, they kind of ad hoc, kind of hack the system. So whether it's hacking the UN tent in northern Iraq or, or, or hacking uh, UN supplies in Pakistan in order to figure out solutions. So this brought me to a moment where um, we were thinking, how can we build a system, not a house, not a school, not a clinic, but a system that can be deployed, built locally, replicated, and hacked as quickly as possible? But we have to do it within the cultural context. And the context we were working was the Middle East. So my, my Middle East design team that are made up of, of, of Persian and Arabic um, architects and designers worked with the refugees, designed with the refugees to come up with this system. I'm going to quickly show this video. And then, yeah. Violence, injustice, war. Two hundred thousand killed. Children. had to leave their homes. To start a new life. Heat, dust, desert, five kilometers per three. 85,000 people live here. Entering and exiting the camp only with permission from police. Yet, some want to see the positive side of their story. The problems uh, inside Syria uh, make uh, uh, the people from Syria become a uh, power for uh, face of the problems until uh, build the, the future and build our homeland through education and the power character. Yeah. People try to live normal lives, yet especially for women and children. Living in a camp is tough. Courage, patience, strength. Everyone here, even the smallest, give all they have and can. Three years and the camp has grown into a city. Most of its inhabitants are children, children of which many work. Children who all believe in a better future, in peace, in education. How should we otherwise build Syria, asks this girl. Where should our engineers and doctors come from if we do not get education now? You can buy and get everything, even supplies for a good meal. Beauty products, clothes for all occasions. Seems you would find anything you need. They call the street with all the shops Champs-Élysées. The Jordanians are generous. They have given the Syrian guests a lot, despite the fact that already every eighth or ninth person in Jordan is a Syrian. 
and the Syrian people have made the impossible possible. They have survived the killing and war, and they cope with hardships of the new life. Many dangers remain. The biggest has a name, Lost Generation. Because uh, I know all the problems uh, around the world. Also, uh, the, uh, the journalists uh, with, uh, have power character. Also, know a lot of uh, people from uh, around the world. Uh, also go uh, a lot of uh, countries uh, about the world. The only protection from being recruited by wrong political and religious groups, education. What if there was a safe construction, durable, deployable, easy and fast to build, energy efficient, sustainable, and most of all, individual designs adapted to the needs of each family, hospital, center, school. So this was our premise, is how could we go beyond just the basic frame? And how can we look at the idea of, of a redeployable structure? So taking a basic uh, design, um, which is an L-shaped design, and this will come apparent very soon why. Um, the, the we set a series of criteria. How can we ensure that we can create a system that can be built by unskilled labor, that we could use um, locally sourced natural and recycled bu building materials, and more importantly, that we can have an edible roof garden to make sure that every school, clinic, and home has the ability to have self-sustaining food system. Um, the reason for that L shape is to create a cluster, which is kind of the extended family unit that you have very typically in the region um, you, uh, that go around a piazza. We eventually do a quarter, so instead of kind of rows, that you begin to create neighborhoods. And once you, ha once you have a camp of at least uh, 32 uh, families, you then put an infrastructure point in there, which is either a clinic or a school. Um, and, and to focus primarily to begin with, um, with, with an educational system. Um, we kind of developed the design. Um, th most importantly for me is a designer shouldn't visit um, the context, they should live the context. If you're not willing to live in the shelter that you're designing, then you're not an architect. You're not. So you have to be able to say, like, we need to design with dignity. And the only way you design with dignity is your own background. So if you're willing to be educated in the school, then you'll be willing to design it. The other thing that was important about this and the key in this is that we spend billions of dollars on the emergency phase. We spend billions of dollars on the transitional phase. We spend billions of dollars to repatriate people back to their country. And then we have to spend tens of billion dollars to rebuild that country. Why couldn't you come up with a system that can be redeployed back into the country? And for instance, you have four teachers volunteering to, to work in the school. At the end of the time of the school, you can wrap up each one of these units. They can go on the back of a, of a car or a truck. You take it back into Syria, you re-put it in into an urban setting, and each uh, teacher, in, uh, for, for having to, to or for, for giving their time in teaching the children of Syria, get a free house so that they can get back to being Syrians again. So this rebuild process was kind of interesting because um, there's UN people here, so how do I delicately put this? We're in your camp. Um, so we had 14 days with an unskilled crew of nine, all who were paid with no on-site power or water. Um, they rapidly built. Um, the nice thing about the humanitarian uh, world is there's so many silos and so many NGOs, everybody thinks you're doing something for somebody else. So you can begin to start doing something without uh, permission. Um, and then um, as a result, you have oversight. This is day three. Actually, people started to know about it. Um, you put this kind of Gabion wall system. It goes up. We put in the frame system. So the, the thing about this particular design is Pelosio, who I work with, who's a, uh, a company based in Udine in Italy, is based off a scaffolding system. Um, the scaffolding itself was used on the uh, uh, rehabilitation of Mecca. So, you know, actually, this is, you know, pretty amazing given the fact it's gone from Mecca to the Zatri. 
And we put in the infill, put on the roof system, um, we could begin to put in the floor to level it. It's the beauty about scaffolding is it's all about leveling, so you can have a completely flat system. Um, we hack the, the flooring, T, there's T at least five times a day. Um, and eventually we start getting onto the roof. Now, I I'm going to stop for a second here. I know I'm going to run over. But um, what I love about this picture is we're putting a farm in the middle of the refugee camp uh, on the roof of a school. But you know, when it, everyone, you don't have to get a Harvard PhD to be a designer. This is a refugee from Syria, and he's used an inside of a tire to create the system to, put, to bring the soil up to the roof. So for me, like, this is the most innovative thing that I found during, during the, the episode. So that's day 12. We've got two more days. Got to work rapidly. Uh, this happened last week, by the way. So, so it should, we should be complete. As we were doing it, um, we started doing infill. The community said we actually want to have a, a kind of a, um, an Adobe-style wall system. Suddenly, these guys who had never built before had become builders. Behind them became builders. They became artists. And what was amazing about it is we started off with what we call a group of refugees, and we ended up with a group of builders. And you know, each one of these guys, you know, you know, they, 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 they built strong because their kids are going to use the school. Um, they became leaders of their team. They created new friends. They became dreamers. He's like, I want this back in Syria. Can't, can't we just take this now? You know, and you can understand the stresses and the strains. And then, for me, this is an architect. An architect isn't someone with a black turtleneck with round glasses who, who's there, like, you know, having a croissant and coffee and is like, you know, these people overseas, I don't know what to, you know. It's somebody who's like, I will live in the camp until we make sure this thing gets done, and then I leave. So a funny thing happened with this project. This is today. Um, so we were kind of pitching this, and we were talking to a couple of groups, and Relief International was taking on that, and we started talking to save the children, and um, so to fund this, um, there's this thing called the Milan Expo, and uh, it's big things. So I decided there's 52 million people who are displaced in the world, and they're stateless. And if we can spend millions of dollars of different countries to have pavilions, why can't displaced people have their own refugee pavilion? So we, from the system, we designed a very tiny abandoned pavilion that's inside the Milan Expo, which you've got to go find, but we split the budget to actually build the school in Jordan. So our funding for this is from the Milan Expo, so maybe something good came out of the Expo. So these guys are underway today. Um, and I, I wanted to say just quickly, because this is an important point. So um, I funded this uh, initially, seed funded it through my 40th birthday. Um, which, yeah, again, you're thinking, like, how? I mean, like, um, but the, the reality is, is we all talk about crowdfunding these things, but it's really like what we're doing, these so minute to, 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 to the need that we need to really scale up and think about these big problems differently. There's a third of a billion people that are going to be mobile because of need. There's also a third of a billion people on the planet that are going to be mobile because of you and I. The fact that that thing is my office right now means that my office today is in Amsterdam. Tomorrow it's going to be in San Francisco. Next week it's going to be in LA. And we are a mobile population. Instead of building 10,000 square foot McMansions, maybe we could build two or three micro homes, which we then commute back and forth to. Like, maybe when climate change happens and you can't live in many of the places that we call home, we are going to have to do that, and we ourselves will become climate change refugees. So this idea of transient design is planning for nomadic communities, is for designing for impermanence, for build for adaption, and to scale via a sharing economy, figuring out revenue streams that not only allow designers to do this sort of work, but allow communities to become self-sufficient without being reliant on, on, on large banking institutions and so forth. So for me, this is small works. Um, right now, we're kind of like a tactical response team. Um, if we were having a war on poverty and you had an army, you need a SWAT team. You need somebody who are the Navy SEALs who go in there and, and get the job done at the start. Well, there's no way that we're going to have large masses of people that can solve this solution. So we have this, the, the best of the brightest. I call them kind of PhD MacGyvers who go out there and do that work. We're a for-purpose for social venture. We're, we're not a nonprofit. Um, uh, but the idea is, can you create a design firm for the next uh, billion? Because the other question I'm trying to solve is, not only can we solve humanity's greatest problems, but can designers have a career doing it without having to not eat 
food or drink water, which is like, seems to be the like, oh, if you want to help people, you have to not eat, right? Or like not have a family, which is, you know, great for ending the peak population issue, but like, you know, it's not so great for relationships. Um, you know, I just want to say one thing about the idea of transient design, the idea that we're doing adaptive design. Quite often in the space of need, we talk about efficiency. Like we need to be as efficient as possible. Have you ever been, okay, let's say you meet someone tonight, partying, a little too much drink, they invite you home, the next morning you wake up and you say to them, how was that? And they were like, that was efficient. <laughs> like, life isn't about efficiency. Like, if you're in an efficient relationship, it's not fun, right? And I think, I know it sounds as crazy to say, like, connecting the last presentation to mine, but we need to add the fun in it. I'm going to end in two seconds. I know. <laughs> they did this last time. Uh, last time I went on for 45 minutes, so don't worry. <laughs> so we just started May 1st. Right now, as saying, uh, we're looking at the idea uh, of cultural diplomacy in Afghanistan, looking at methodologies to kind of demilitarize a country that has been burdened for the last 20, 25 years by an architecture of hate and an architecture of defense, and so that you're having an environment where people are always on the back end. Um, in Somalia, we're looking at the idea of taking that kind of uh, rebuild project and creating a, a village for Dr. Mama Hawa, who's like this amazing doctor who's kind of run this camp, um, who's probably watching from... Um, in Nepal, we're working with indigenous builders, um, amazing bamboo architects who, who are throughout the country. You know, the problem in most disasters is everyone's like, oh my God, we need experts to go over there because obviously there's no one who knows anything. No. Like, actually, if you actually understand the network of intelligence, we are all equally intelligent. And so, therefore, you would understand that we have some incredible designers and architects who are Nepalese. Um, I'm doing a crazy project looking at um, coloring mechanism for large cats, which is reintroducing cheetahs into the Namibian desert. Um, and then, of course, um, one big project that I think a lot of designers here might want to get involved in is rethinking the public utility system in informal settlements and making um, the residents of these informal settlements as the owners of the utilities. And by doing that is kind of creating public companies, not the monopoly, but a cooperly. And so uh, in the next six months, we actually have a project that's about to roll out where you can buy shares in this uh, in this uh, company, this utility company, which will actually be a co-shared company on a global and on a low level. And then two more fun projects. But two seconds. You already had your two, two seconds are left. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you want, you want, okay, give me, okay, we'll flip this one. Okay, go, go. See, see listen to the people. <laughs> okay, two more minutes. Okay. <laughs> I I'm skip the questions, okay? okay. No, question, no, question. no questions, no, no questions, no questions. Okay, that's okay. Fine. My, my Twitter questions. account is CA Sinclair. If you have a question, put it on there. I will, I will email you it back, and then people can get the question. Uh, we'll go back one, because this one's cool. So um, one, <laughs> this is a really great project. So right now, there are hundreds of thousands of military troops returning back home with PTSD. And it turns out that, um, that um, a lot of these troops, they've been trying to figure out um, therapy, PTSD therapy things. And a lot of them like electronic dance music. So one of the projects we're developing is a sound therapy studio to tackle PTSD for returning troops, which also doubles as a recording studio. And it turns out that the EDM community are the ideal community to partner with. So we're looking at mixing DJs from, from EDM with designers, with uh, returning vets to come up with this sound therapy. And so that will happen next year. And then the final project, I think it's my final project, I'm working with this uh, big, which is uh, it's a small design firm. They were in Copenhagen. Um, to um, where was the dude? Where's Sam? He was great. So he wanted an iceberg. What we're doing is we're working to build a dinner table out of a broken glacier. That's a glacier that collapsed last year. And what we've done is we've captured it. And we're, there's going to be climate change talks in Iceland next uh, year. And these guys, the, you know, they go to these nice hotels and they sit there and like, oh, what should we do about the climate? Uh, I think we should do a white paper discussing how important the climate is. Yes, maybe there's a press release. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the climate change talks on on the melting glacier, um, the, the meal will be served at. And as they try to come to a resolution, the table will collapse on them. Um, <laughs> because...
And, and we've, set, we've set this meal, we're working with some great chefs, we've set this meal, either it's gonna be a, 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 a meal about love, that we're gonna protect the planet we're on, or it's gonna be a meal about loss, the fact that we are the endangered species and we screwed the pooch on this one. So um, there's a pavilion. Um, so this is us. Um, I'm also building a school in Africa, uh, um, uh, a hospital in Africa, but apparently everyone's building a hospital in Africa. <laughs> so I kind of cut that out. But um, my architect, um, Matt Hughes, is somewhere in the audience. Um, you'll, tell, you'll know who it is because he was a very handsome architect and then he worked for me for two years. Um, so he looks disheveled, um, but uh, we're doing that. And then um, I'm looking for people who would like to get involved. Thank you. Always look